Please allow me to introduce you to Worship Brother James Innes. James has been a Freemason for over 22 years and was initiated, passed and raised in Southwark Lodge, London 879 and holds the rank of Senior London Grand Rank. James is also part of many progressive orders, some of which include the Holy Royal Arch of Jerusalem, Mark Master Masons, the Ancient and Honourable Fraternity of Royal Arch Mariners, Rose Choir, Knights Templar, Allied Masonic Degree, and many others. How he manages to fit this all in, along with being a father and a husband and running those business, I have no idea. Um, James is incredibly open about the fact that he himself suffers from depression and has conducted various lectures and editorials on the topic, helping many people along the way. So I hope we all get to gain some fruitful knowledge from this today. If you've got any questions, like I say, please do stick around for the Q&As afterwards. Um, thank you very much, James. The floor is yours. Well, yes, good afternoon, everyone, um, or good morning, or indeed, I think, good evening, depending on time zone, um, and welcome. I think we've got a wonderful gathering of people here from all around the world um, and all sorts of different time zones today, obviously mainly in the UK, but I think we've got some in Hong Kong, Amit told me, certainly. Um, many of you I know, of course, and uh, many of you I don't, but in all cases, I'm delighted and indeed honoured to have this opportunity to address you today, and I hope I can do that on a justice. We do live in interesting times, don't we, to say the least. Um, this is certainly not what one would call a typical Masonic gathering. Um, well, it's the new normal maybe, but I'm just going to try to visualize you all sitting around tables, white shirts, black ties, and quite possibly munching that uh, ubiquitous chocolate mint, whilst I try to inform and maybe even entertain you. So, James Innes, the man who can turn your life around, the promotional flyer for this event says, I can't help but feel like I might have been a teeny tiny bit oversold there. Now, if we were talking about your working life and your career, then it could well be true. And indeed, that tagline was adapted from a tabloid headline about me a few years back. In my professional life, I'm known as the jobs guru. Um, I give credit for that nickname to the very lovely Anne Diamond, who coined it live on BBC Radio with me. Um, I was very embarrassed, and my publicist was very delighted. But we're here today not to talk about me in any kind of professional capacity, or even really in a Masonic capacity. We're here to talk about depression, something which is very topical at the moment, I know. So I'm really pleased to be here today to, to be able to do this. Depression is something I really cannot claim to be an expert on at all but it's something I suffer from. It's something which has always been and doubtless always will be a significant part of my life. And I'm here to share uh, my experience, my, my personal experience, my, my private experience of depression with you. I'm here to speak um, as a so-called depressive, a term I don't actually like very much, but uh, for which the dictionary definition is a, a person suffering from or tending to suffer from depression. But what is depression? Well, we will talk a little bit later, or I will talk rather, about the science. Um, but first of all, I want to give you, as I say, something of my own personal perspective on it. Uh, in the most recent issue of Freemasonry Today, they published an article I wrote, uh, uh, Bitten by the Black Dog. Some of you would have seen it. Uh, some may even have read it. Others won't. Bitten by the Black Dog. Now, as a quick aside, this obviously references a phrase used by Churchill a phrase I rather like, but which the historical evidence says it has been pointed out to me many times, it shows it isn't or wasn't actually a reference to depression, but rather bad or black moods, an expression used by strict Victoria nannies as it happens. But the expression, the black dog, has now generally been adopted, rightly or wrongly, to refer to depression and whether or not Churchill likes it or not. So I begin my article with a, a quote, a paraphrase from something I've heard many times. Really, James? You? You're the last person I can imagine suffering from depression. You're always so fun, so lively, so positive about everything. I just don't understand how you could be depressive. See, I've heard words to that effect quite a few times in my life. It often comes as a surprise to people to find out that I'm a depressive. I don't really mind this reaction. I, I, I suppose in many ways I should take it perhaps as a compliment. I normally just smile sweetly, but inside I'm saying to myself, no, no, you, you don't understand, do you? But why should they as well, you see? I mean, I understand depression, I suffer from it, but if you don't suffer from depression yourself or know anyone who does, then indeed, why should you understand it? 
chances are though that you almost definitely do know someone who suffers from depression the catch is that not everyone talks about it and for often very valid reasons i'll come on to that in a minute now i've never hidden my depression i've never had a problem with disclosing it or discussing it but i've never really shouted it from the rooftops either in this speech talk presentation lecture whatever it is it's pretty much a, a first for me in my Masonic life, I am, um, I had my CV reeled off there very kindly by Emmys, but among other things, I'm currently master of uh, Charterhouse Deo Dante, Daily Launch number 2885. In this capacity, I've been fortunate enough in the past year to be able to make a personal choice of charity to receive a healthy donation from the Lodge. And I chose a small, but important to me at least, charity, the Charlie Waller Memorial Trust. It's a charity that is um, perhaps best described by quoting the opening line from their website. Our vision is of a world where people understand and talk openly about depression. Now, evidently, I like to think that I'm contributing to that vision in being here with you today. So that was obviously an agenda item. When it came to that item, I said, I'd like to say a few words. And, you know, I am the master after all, if you don't mind. I said, many, if not indeed most of you, know that I suffer from depression. Depression is an illness which, well, it can be very unpleasant sometimes, sometimes unbearable, and it drives some people to take their own lives. And I went on for a bit, robbing the brethren of, of valuable drinking time. But I was subsequently st stunned afterwards how many people came up to me after the meeting, either straight up to me or quietly later on in the evening, to specifically comment on this really relatively small part of the meeting. The most touching example, I noted, and I noted earlier, he's actually here with us today. Obviously, I'm not going to name him. He said, James, I just wanted to thank you for what you said. Now, you don't know this, James, but I too suffer from depression. And I think you're probably, the, I think he said, the fourth person in the world that I have told. It was almost like he was confessing something to me. And that alone was a reason enough for me to want to write about this, this important subject for Freemasonry today, and then to go on and to, to conduct this talk today. Um, another chap, a uh, really rather senior Freemason, he emailed me afterwards. Um, he said, and I quote, I'm so very sorry to hear that you have been bitten by the black dog. I have bitter memories and experience of it and have come out the other side um, none the worse, seemingly, although it felt overwhelming at the time. So my camera gone out of focus there. I should stop moving around, picking up my papers. Depression, to me at least, and I think, I hope most of you will agree, it is nothing to be ashamed of. Uh, I was first diagnosed 25 years ago, shortly before becoming a Freemason. I became a Freemason as a young man. I was diagnosed with depression as a pretty young man. 25 years ago, we've come a long way, but there's still considerable stigma. Uh, so many people choose to keep it to themselves, as I mentioned earlier, because they're scared of triggering, triggering some kind of negative reaction from others. They just don't want to take the risk. And I... You know, I'm prepared to talk about it, but I really can't blame them for not wanting to. Robin Williams said, all it takes is a beautiful fake smile to hide an injured soul and they will never notice how broken you really are. And I've kind of mastered that, I think, actually. It's all too easy to hide it. It really is. To be a comedian, to disguise it, to, to, to you know, deflect attention. And yet it's so counterproductive. It's a cliche, but a problem shared really can be a problem halved. And studies have shown how sociability can be immensely helpful uh, for people, uh, everybody, I think, really, but particularly people suffering from depression. I certainly knew I was a, a freaking reason for, for more than one good reason. My own mental health problems are something that I battle with, literally, on, on a daily basis. And those who find me so fun, lively, positive, whatever lovely adjectives they throw my way, they don't realize it's quite simply my primary coping mechanism. It's an act in many ways. Every day it's an effort to get out of bed and face the world. And it's only by being so positive and sometimes literally, you know, slapping myself around the face in the morning and forcing myself to conjure up some positive energy out of nowhere that I'm at all able to function. It's like how many comedians suffer from depression. I mentioned Robin Williams earlier. It's quite common to make up for it with humor, with positivity, because you're fighting against it. So depressives are often hard to detect because they are positive and cheerful and fun people. It's their way of coping with it. So I'm prepared to talk about it. I understand that some others aren't, but I can but encourage them to do this, to, to, to at least share with the people closest to them their issues of mental health, their friends, maybe even their brothers. I can understand the apprehension, 
but certainly from my point of view, it's certainly very much worth it. It wasn't easy for me to stand up um, in Open Lodge and speak from the heart about it. That's a pretty unusual thing to happen in, in a lodge meeting. But every reaction I had, without exception, was a positive one. So I, I definitely don't think myself likely to suffer from depression, but I do think myself very lucky indeed to be so well supported by so many good people. So the sciencey bit, what exactly is depression? I fully appreciate that some people really don't understand at all. Uh, if you haven't met anybody, there's nobody in entourage and yourself don't suffer from it. How can you really be expected to understand it? Um, it is very difficult to describe. So I'm going to give this a medical description here for those who are unsure and those who quite simply don't know. It's often described as a, a chemical imbalance in the brain. That is the root cause. It is chemical in origin. And that in itself uh, may well be news to some, but describing it as a, a chemical uh, disorder is a great simplification of what is a very complex illness. And there are many different types of depression, many different types of depressive, um, all with their own subtleties to their own personal experience of it. Yes, brain chemicals certainly come into it. Serotonin, uh, norepinephrine, dopamine, but it's also closely linked to stressful, there's probably no surprise here, but closely linked to stressful and traumatic life events. They may trigger lifelong depression for some people, childhood incidents can cause life, lifelong depression, or in others they may just result in episodic depression. Something dramatic happens, they get chemically unbalanced and they suffer from depression for a while and then they come out of it, it might be fine for the next 20 years before something else happens. I certainly know people like that. So in terms of stressful and traumatic life events, I think we're pretty much all going through one in one way or another at the moment. So yeah, I'm gonna move on to talking about COVID-19, its impact on the world's mental health, um, including those present in this, in this room, so to speak, um, because I'm still visualizing around your tables eating your chocolate mints, and, and how that might be mitigated. Now, this whole lockdown situation isn't easy, for many of us, I would say perhaps most of us. A survey after the first three weeks, obviously we, we, you know, we, that's a while ago now, but it's a particularly powerful survey, well and thoroughly conducted. It's indicated that half of the population were feeling more anxious and depressed than normal. Okay, that's perhaps not a great surprise. Over a third said they were having trouble sleeping. 15% were already finding the restrictions very challenging and there's Many again said they expected they wouldn't be able to cope within the next month. So that's another third. So I dread to think what the picture looks like now. We're, as I say, we're approaching the end of the sixth week. And I think the most interesting article I've seen recently um, makes reference to a paper in the, again, I've got it here, I hope my camera doesn't get right out of focus, uh, in the Lancet Psychiatry. Um, I'm just going to quote just a tiny bit here. The paper says there is a risk that the numbers of people with depression and those self-harming or taking their own lives will increase. During the SARS epidemic of 2003, for example, there was a 30% increase in suicide in the over 65. 30% over 65. That's a, a, an age bracket which doesn't see much suicide. A quarter of all suicides are in the 18 to 25 bracket, which is a very narrow window age-wise, but particularly suffers from a high suicide rate. So this is a dramatic increase in the over 65s there. The paper added that the policies used to manage the pandemic would inevitably have serious effects on mental health by increasing unemployment, financial insecurity, and poverty. Now, lockdown, of course, might be saving many of us from actually dying or getting seriously ill from this virus, but it is taking its toll in mental health. I'm not going to argue one way or other the benefits of lockdown, whether it's the right thing to do. I, you know, that's out of my field of expertise. I'm just saying that there is a noticeable impact on mental health as a result. So what can people do about it? Now, if you remember those studies I referred to showing how sociability can be immensely helpful for people who do suffer from depression or experiencing depression. Well, obviously the opposite applies. If you isolate people, many will become depressed, including many who have never previously experienced this illness and are therefore ill-equipped to handle it. If you had a lifetime's practice of battling this illness, you actually, after a while, if you've managed not to kill yourself early on, you get quite good at coping with it. It does, in, in many cases, not all, let's look at Robin Williams, in many cases it becomes easier. But if you've never previously experienced this illness, I can imagine that is quite a shock. So what can you do? Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm just going to run through some of the key NHS guidelines, because quite frankly, they put it much better than I, than I ever could. To, to coin a phrase, I am not a doctor. So 
very brief, just one little A4 sheet here. I'm trying to get my camera back into focus there. Okay. So stay connected with others. Maintaining healthy relationships with people you trust is important for your mental well-being. No surprises there. Think about how you can stay in touch with friends and family while you are all staying at home by phone, messaging, video calls, or social media, whether it's people you usually see often or connecting with old friends. That's a particularly important point, I think. Talk about your worries. It's normal to feel a bit worried. Again, that's another very important point, to realize that what you're experiencing is normal. There's nothing wrong with you, it's the situation. It's normal to feel a bit worried, scared, or helpless about the current situation. Remember, it's okay to share your concerns with others you trust, and doing so may help them too. It's not just okay to share your concerns with others you trust, it's good for you, and it can be good for them as well. It might help them to open up too. Look after your body. Our physical health has a big impact on how we feel. At times like these, it can be easy to fall into unhealthy patterns of behavior that end up making you feel worse. And I'm pretty sure a lot of people listening to me right now can relate to that in one way or another. I think the nation's health, despite Joe Wicks, has gone downhill rather than the past uh, six weeks or so. Stay on top of difficult feelings. Concern about the coronavirus outbreak is perfectly normal. Some people may experience intense anxiety that can affect their day-to-day -day life though. So try to focus on the things that you can control, such as how you act, who you speak to, where you get your information from. Do not stay glued to the news. Try to limit the time you spend watching, reading, or listening to coverage of the outbreak, including on social media. And think about turning off breaking news alerts on your phone. Look after your sleep. Good quality sleep makes a big difference to how we feel, so it's important to get enough. Now, I have three small children, so I'm suffering badly in that respect at the moment. But after a lifetime of experience with depression, I do know the link between sleep and depression in general. Mental health is, is quite dramatic. Sleep is very important indeed. Try to maintain your regular sleeping pattern and stick to good sleep practices. Now, I got an email earlier today from Patient Access, obviously part of the NHS, um, specifically about sleep. Um, which I'll read very briefly. If you've been finding it harder to keep your normal sleeping patterns during the pandemic, you're not alone. Whether you're struggling with insomnia, experiencing vivid nightmares, or finding it tough to get out of bed in the mornings, the lockdown is taking a toll on our beauty sleep. Sleep is crucial to our well-being. Without it, we can be left feeling stressed and anxious, and feeling more stressed and anxious can prevent us from sleeping. Taking care of your mental health and establishing good sleep hygiene is as important as ever, and if your sleeping problems persist, your GP can advise you on next steps to take to get back on track. Now, a lot of people are avoiding going to their GPs at all at the moment with anything they might consider to be minor. And a lot of people consider sleeping issues to be minor, not if they're directly related to your mental health. GPs are still taking in patients quite happily and quite willingly. You don't have to be at death's door to call up your GP. And the final point on their list here is to keep your mind active. Uh, read, write, play games, do crosswords, complete Sudoku puzzles, finish jigsaws, drawing, painting, whatever floats your boat really. Listen to people like me pontificate on Zoom. Whatever it is, find something that works for you. So I'd also like, because I think this is particularly valuable too, to, to try to give you some background into how to help uh, someone with depression, how to spot the signs of someone. If you don't suffer depression yourself, but how to spot the signs in others and how to help them. And again, I, I've taken you know, information here from our wonderful NHS because they do put it better than I could. Um, they, do, they start off by pointing out that depression has so many possible symptoms. And as I said earlier, there are many different types of depression. But common symptoms, lost interest in doing things they normally enjoy, feeling down or hopeless, obviously, has slower speech and movements, or conversely, more fidgety and restless feels tired, doesn't have much energy, overeating, or lost their appetite. So there's a real spectrum there. Sleeping more than usual or isn't able to sleep. Trouble concentrating on everyday things. So it's sudden changes in behavior like that to one extreme or another. It goes on to specify in greater detail the signs of depression in older people. Um, empty fridges and cupboards, they just give up on eating. Neglected appearance, poor hygiene, and they might even show little join receiving visitors. Now, of course, many of those symptoms I've just mentioned are, 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 are you know, symptoms that probably many of us in lockdown are suffering from anyway, in any case. So it doesn't necessarily help too much, but it gives you a bit of a heads up as to, as to what to look out for. And the tips to help someone who does seem down or you suspect of suffering from depression, let them know that you care and that you are there to listen. Accept them as they are without judging them. 
gently encourage them to help themselves. Get information about the services available to them. And on that point, I should mention that psychotherapy is readily available by Skype now, both before lockdown and, and now in the midst of it, you can find a psychiatrist or a psychotherapist on Skype. Not a problem. You don't need to leave your house. Stay in touch with the individual, whether it's messaging, texting, phoning, but do keep tabs on them. Try to be patient. And on a personal note, I'll add in, you know, don't, whatever you do, tell them to pull themselves together. That's one of the common reactions to someone from suffering from depression. Oh, come on, chin up, stiff up a lip, pull yourself together, it'll be all right. Um, that really doesn't help at all. Naturally, if you're really worried about the person, uh, they're expressing suicidal feelings, um, or you think they pose a suicide risk, then you need to seek professional help urgently. Either NHS 111 or the Samaritans. I know we've got a deputy director of the Samaritans in the audience today. Hopefully he might uh, say a few words later. And their number is 116123. So I do hope you found this informative, both me sharing my personal experience of depression, um, trying to identify what depression actually is as an illness, because it is somewhat nebulous, and also looking at ways that you can tackle it and also help others who are going through it themselves. So very quickly, I'd like to finish by uh, thanking a few people uh, for um, well, allowing me to be here today. First of all, the charming and persuasive Tim McAndrews for, um, well, for basically for volunteering me for this. Um, it reminds me of that film, uh, The Blue Max Tim, you are either very brave or very foolish. Uh, Mahir Kilik and Emmett Wheats for organizing, um, and not just for organizing this, this particular talk, but for their whole uh, Freemasons Without Borders initiative, which I, I personally think is quite simply brilliant and which I'm now very proud to be a part of. I should probably thank my wife, uh, who's let me barricade myself in all day looking after the children, and uh, I haven't had a child break down the door yet. Um, and last, but certainly not least, I want to thank um, all of you for taking the time today to be present and to be um, a part of something here today. Something we've shared, something which, as I said at the beginning, may be a very um, unusual Masonic experience, and yet something which I feel is uh, simultaneously quintessentially Masonic. Thank you.